let me start by talking a bit about why I work on clean energy. So my previous job was all about oil and gas, and I spent my time presenting the risk that oil and gas development was creating, especially for our climate. And I realized we were basically winning every environmental argument. We were right about the impacts on the caribou, the tailings ponds, the air pollution. We were certainly right about the climate impacts, but we weren't really winning. And that was because for every brilliant environmental argument that we made, the other team would answer with jobs, GDP, and investment. And I realized that until my team could give good answers on jobs, GDP, and investment, politicians would struggle to act on things like tailings ponds or carbon pollution. And I knew the right answer was clean energy, of course. So I came to work at the brilliantly named Clean Energy Canada and started talking about jobs, GDP, and investment. But here's my confession. When I started working on clean energy, and this was in May of 2014, I wasn't totally convinced that the case we were making was persuasive. There was lots of evidence that clean energy was an economic winner, but it still felt like oil was king of the castle. I've been to the boardroom of the Canadian Wind Energy Association, and I've been to the Petroleum Club in Calgary, and they didn't quite feel like they were in the same league. 100 year head start has its advantages, right? So what I told myself then was that no matter how it felt in my little corner of the world, things were starting to shift outside of our borders. When the President of the United States and the Chancellor of Germany say that clean energy matters, it matters. When the President of China starts to say the same thing, it really matters. Elsewhere in the world, leaders were starting to believe there was an answer to jobs, GDP, and investment that had nothing to do with fossil fuels. So that was my state of mind in 2014. I knew it was happening out there, but I didn't really feel it. It's like late February in Ottawa. The days are getting a little bit brighter, the air is a little bit warmer. You know in your mind that winter can't last forever, and then suddenly one day, snow is melting everywhere and it's spring. And that's where we are now. Now you don't have to care about climate change at all to believe that clean energy is an economic powerhouse. I could give you quotes all afternoon from climate heroes like Al Gore or the UNFCCC's Christiana Figueres, but maybe a couple from the other side of the spectrum might be even more persuasive. So last month, Al Monaco, the CEO behind the Northern Gateway Oil Sands Pipeline proposal, said that clean energy is where the growth is going to be, both in North America and globally. So he's shifting his company's portfolio because, quote, we have to look at what the fundamentals are telling us. And from just last week, Quoting again, people need to get their heads around the idea that fossil fuels are probably dead, the CEO of Canadian Pacific Railway said on Wednesday. A guy who admits he's maybe, quote, not as green as he should be. Why are they saying things like this now? Well, I'll give you two reasons. First, the cost of clean power just keeps falling. So it's the winning option on price alone in a growing number of jurisdictions. Unsubsidized, Wind in the U.S. costs 60% less now than it did in 2009, and solar costs 80% less. That sounds impressive. It is impressive. But it's also entirely normal, because clean energy is a technology rather than a commodity. You're not paying for the wind, the sun, or the water. You're paying for the turbines, the inverters, the panels. So in the same way that my iPhone today is cheaper and better in every way than a cell phone built in 1995, Clean energy gets cheaper and better the more of it we built. So those trends are partly why clean energy just had its best year ever. With over $350 billion invested in 2015, nearly 50% more than what was invested in fossil-fueled electricity. And clean energy did this at a time when prices for fossil fuel competitors, for its fossil fuel competitors, were low. Just look at the U.S. For the first time ever last year, it brought more solar online than natural gas for electricity, investing a total of over $50 billion in clean power. Under President Obama, U.S. solar power has grown 20 fold and has created jobs at 10 times the national average rate. See, it's all about jobs, GDP, and investment. No wonder clean energy now gets a spot at the top of the agenda when the President meets with the Prime Minister. So second, our second reason here, Paris, the thing we're here to talk about today. Because Paris brought everyone on board, and because it aims to keep warming well below 2 degrees Celsius, 
because it acknowledges similarly in convoluted language that we need net zero emissions in the second half of the century, or by the middle of the century. Paris has become a backstop for the clean energy sector's momentum. Before Paris, you could maybe look at today's clean energy trends and say they're temporary or they're a blip. Now you have to at least acknowledge there's an international agreement pushing the sector to go even further and even faster. Because clean energy is fundamentally, it's the way we're gonna solve climate change. Assessments of how you get to deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions show we need to switch out fossil fuels and switch in clean power. Drive our cars with clean power, heat our homes with clean power. This means we need to cut energy waste as much as possible, but we're also gonna to have to build a lot more clean power around the world. And that's why the market fundamentals are telling people like Al Monaco from Enbridge that clean power is just gonna keep growing. In the kind of work I do, I'm often asked whether there's a role for Canada in all this. I think right now Canadians often acknowledge that yeah, clean energy is an economic opportunity, but they worry that the US and China have already cornered the market. And we are late to the party here, and we do need to make up for that fast. But fortunately, despite the federal government's lack of interest over the past decade, Canada still has the highest percentage of renewable electricity on our grid amongst G7 members today, as well as a competitive clean tech sector. For example, Guelph-based company Canadian Solar was the world's second biggest PV module manufacturer as of late 2015. But the bigger point is that this actually isn't optional for anyone. It's like sitting around in the year 2000 and saying, does my business need a website? Yeah, you do. Everyone does. So very quickly, if clean energy delivers jobs, GDP, and investment, and if it's now inevitable that we're going to need to keep building more of it, what does that mean for Canada? Here are three implications for federal policy. First, we need a serious national climate plan, which will of course have clean energy at the heart of it, because every serious climate plan has clean energy at the heart of it. Second, we need a price on carbon pollution across the country to make sure clean energy's competitors are paying something closer to their real costs. And we need a whole suite of economic policies to build a strong and internationally competitive clean energy sector. It's finally starting to happen.